everyone. Uh, this is Joseph Osco with American News Post in today's sports podcast show on Thursday, July the 25th, 2013. I'm here with Michael Magnifici. Good afternoon, everybody. And Frank Coconati. How are you? Very good, sir. All right. Uh, I think we're going to start with football in Hernandez uh, specifically. Yeah, he went to trial yesterday, Frank. He uh, It was a, like a discovery trial, but they postponed it. It was a hearing. It was a hearing, hearing. Okay. and he's being uh, he's alleged to have had two other homicides that they're going into, and they're going to you know try to hook him into like three murders. And they've been questioning the New England Patriots as far as this guy dropped down to the fourth uh, draft. I mean, the fourth round of the draft, and why did he drop down? Because people were rushing him off the boards because of character issues. He obviously had the physical talents. He played for Florida with Urban Meyer. Uh, with Tim Tebow was his quarterback. This guy, you know, lit up the NCAA. Double A. Right, right. He was unbelievable. Won a championship there with right. people, and they're wondering why he went down to the fourth round. Or, you know, I think an overall 130th pick, something like right. that. So there was a lot of teams that knew a lot about his character, his gang relations, his this and that, and, and they're wondering why New England Patriots, with with Kraft, Bob Kraft is the owner, and Bill Belichick is the head coach, that they've called the Patriot way in the last 13 years. They make themselves so much, you know, they won three Super Bowls, they've been divided, and they, you know, they just pride themselves well, on having Bill a character, you know, Bill building characters. Right. Belichick probably figured he could mold the guy, or maybe the guy was, right. you know, in a point where he could teach him something and, you know, straighten him out, but uh, it doesn't seem that way. No. The guy is not when he's I watched him in court, and we both agreed he looked like arrogant. He looked oh, he like didn't did. care. He, he looked, looked like Capone in court. Right. You know, like I got the jury fixed. I'm right. not worried about anything. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But we all saw how that movie ended. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. How it ended in real life. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Wound up getting 15 yeah. years. Um, Don't watch their hands. Belichick and them. Oh, they they, they, push, well, they they cut them out already. They right. they cut them already. Yeah. And, they but, and they're players. just going to look to move on. And, and Belichick yesterday was interesting. He had a press conference for the first time because his team is coming today to uh, opening, you know, opening the practice, training, right? Practice. Spring training, and he uh, he didn't, you know, shy away. He did a seven-minute dialogue begin to begin with about Aaron Hernandez and about how disappointed they were, this and that, and then said that it's a judicial matter. I will not answer any more questions. Right. That's how they. That's uh, how they get away from it. Well, we, we both know there's a bigger issue in football. Well, sure. You know, guys like him. There's there's quite a quite a few guys like uh, Hernandez with problems and uh, anger issues. And anger and issues and all these guys that are 6'6", uh, six, six, 300 pounds, bench press a building, they're right. carrying guns. Right. Or, or I, I would feel confident I could handle any situation unless I was going right. into a shooting range. Right. And I'm the target. Yeah. I don't know why these guys need, feel the need to be carrying pistols. We had them here in Chicago with that Tank Williams and right. some other guys. That is correct. Yeah. A guy actually got killed with Tank Williams, but the Bears forgave him for a year and then released him. Well, there's just so much going on. And, and, you know, young kids get a lot of money at 20 years old, 21. You get millions and millions, millions of dollars. dollars. You know, they're, they're adults then. You know, 21, 22 years old. They're, they're adults. It's not yeah. like they have to have their parents watching over them. And they just make, you know, poor decisions. I, you know what? I, I honestly... That's I why the coaches, Frank, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, that's no, why no. the coaches and, the, you know, and managers of baseball and coaches of basketball, they have to be more... They're like more of a father figure right. with these guys. They have to be there because they're away from their families. Right. They're away from their fathers, but you know, they're their concerned mothers. with winning. That's all they're concerned with. And they if don't a guy can run a four four forty and bench us like you say, 500 pounds, well, they right. can care less. They really, as long as they don't kill somebody like this guy did, or race They make an embarrassment out of the organization. Right. They want to win. They, they want to win a yeah. strip. They, they, and, they, they, and it's gotten to that point where these guys are become superhuman beings. At no cost. You, yeah. s- you see what they do. Yeah. You know. But it brings us right in the, the in baseball. baseball. You know, this Ryan Braun, would he, uh, I don't know if we touched on it on Monday, a little bit we did, that he has given, uh, Aaron Rodgers is his good buddy. They own a restaurant together in Milwaukee. Right. You know, he's with Green Bay Packers, he's with the Milwaukee Brewers, Ryan Braun is, and they own a restaurant together in Milwaukee. And after Braun won his appeal for being tested positive for his, uh, PEDs, Rodgers said that he would give up his salary 
if they could, you know, after the appeal, if he could, give, he would give up a salary, which he's going to make this year. He's going to make eight point five million. If, if Braun tested positive, if Braun tested positive, Braun well, right. now here he winds up pleading guilty, and just makes Aaron Rodgers look like you know he stood like out on a limb, like right. just like a, you know, right. it's, just, it, it's a sad thing for him. But that's his friend, yeah. and you do those things for your friends, yeah. you know. He he believed them, you know, and he at least the, I, I, you know, the, why I got a issue with that with Ryan Braun is tell your buddy. Right. Tell him to give him the skinny on what's really going on with you. Right. You know, listen, this is my problem. This is what I've been doing. This is what I did. I did it for the sake. I got 120. Yeah. I got 133 million coming in the next and seven don't years. Put, you, put, don't put your neck on the chop. Right. Right. Don't the don't weekend. stick out for me because if I get caught, I don't want you getting screwed up. You know, and that's what he he should have done. He treated Aaron Rodgers like he treated everybody else, like a chump. But they, and you don't treat your friends like marks. I mean, you so don't do you that. You know what? It, and it's funny the, the pressure put on those small players now about steroids. I can't believe these football players are not on steroids. Well, I, I football, cannot believe that. Frank, in football, the reason why football gets a pass from it, this is, Dicka said it years ago. They said it's a contact sport. Dicka said it's not a contact sport. It's a collision sport. You get collisions every time you get tackled. And we, as the, you know, the fans, we will give football a pass for doing steroids because they're big guys and they're you know running and like you said four two forties and you know it's like torpedoes come at you and we don't mind that doing it. Baseball is a hell of sport. The records are a hell of thing. You know you don't when you cheat baseball with steroids and you hit like Bonds hit all those home runs. Yeah. That you're cheating Roger Maris out of the sixty one that he hit right. to beat Babe Ruth at sixty. You know. And you don't do that. Those records stand forever. We still recognize the Babe Ruth, the Ty Cobbs. Right. You know. Right. We we still recognize those records. And I, you know, and I'm I'm for that too. If you're oh, using do. something to influence or to uh, enhance your uh, power and enhance, it's not fair. Well, I just don't know. You know, you still got to hit the ball. And I was a ball player, and the hardest thing in the world to do is to hit a round ball with a round bat. Right. If that's the they documented it. It's a fact. Now, when it comes out that PEDs and, and steroids makes a warning track home run become a home run, then you tell me. Because I don't know, you hit it on the label and it still goes out of the park when it's supposed to be a routine fly ball to left field. Right. If that's the case, then I say they cheated. Because I'm really not that much against it. I say give it to them all. Let them all do it. Let them all take as much as they want. Is somebody going to be better than somebody else? They're not all going to hit 75 home runs apiece. You know, yeah, somebody, you know. <laughs> somebody's, no, I mean, you're going to have a lot of big numbers. They claim it, 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 it the eye, it, it, it sharpens the eye, you know, when you're big. Hand eye. You know, your hand eye, right, your uh, timing, it sharpens, um, naturally gets your muscles bigger. Right. And then they claim it, it, um, heals when you're injured. Well, that, it heals the that uh, was the main thing with which steroids. Is unbelievable. That they, they originally came out why they wanted steroids was because it made you come back from injury quicker. Right. And the same with football players. Football players, you know, they only got a, well, back then they had 14, they had 12 game season, 14 right. game season, now we got a 16 game season. You don't want to be out of the box for six weeks. No, you're because, gone. you, you know, be some other guy comes in there and makes, you know, 20 tackles and right. three interceptions. Right. You out. lost your job. Right. You know, you're not back up and, you know, you come re uh, renegotiation time right. for a contract, you're out of the box. But there's a reason for the uh, illegality of it because it does hurt you as an individual when you take steroids. Well, sure it does. They claim it brings cancer. It claims it, it uh, screws up your genetics. Well, Pete Rose said you know, today on the... Dan Patrick show, who was saying about the steroids, he says it would be a hard choice for me to make. Yeah. He says back then, he says, you know, we took amphetamines. Right. Because we were playing, you know, double, you know, they don't do that in baseball as much. Remember back then, yeah, it was like double headers every, every right. week, you know. Right. And uh, we play a, a nighttime, you know, a day night right. game, and we'd have a day game the next day. You right. know, we're traveling over, you know, from Cincinnati over, right. To, right. you know, or San Diego, excuse me. And they would, he said, you know, we, we did amphetamines. Mike Schmidt admitted it, Hall of Famer. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it was like no big deal. Everybody looks over that, you right? Know? And it was, you know, it was like taking that five-hour energy now, right? You know, right. But a uh, steroid actually changes the structure, changes the structure of, the muscle, of, your, of the muscle, the the, the, um, the sh your strength, your what you can do with the ball. I mean, it's it's where do we draw a line? What, right? Are we just going to put robots up there? Right. Well, that's what Rose said. He, he goes, if that stuff was around, available like it is now, when I was playing. 
He says I might have had fifty five hundred hits yeah. rather than forty was he at forty four ninety two right. or something like that. Right. And but he was going into how his uh, departure from baseball suspension over twenty three he got suspended in nine eighty nine. So that's uh, twenty four years actually. And he was saying that he doesn't understand how, you know, people are still on the ballot. He's not even, you know, he can't even get on the ballot for the Hall of Fame. Right. Because I'm sure that there's some right. I'm, I'm vote for him. For him. Oh, I, 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 I would vote for him. And for him. I think a lot, I don't think people give a crap about games. He didn't, you know, he wasn't fixing games. Yeah. He didn't do that. He wasn't the 1919 White Sox. He didn't you know, bet against his he team. He never bet against his team. I know that for a fact. Exactly. And that's, that's what swung me when you revealed that to me. You know when he you said he's not. I know for a fact because you took you had the guy taking his bets. Right. He always was for his team. Always bet his team. Like Charles O'Finley, right? You always bet Oakland. Right. I Never. mean, there's a difference there. They got, I mean, and you're betting your team to win. You're not. Finley if you bet him to lose, enough. you can see on what they're going to lay down. How's it going to Finley wasn't a baseball better, but when Oakland got into the playoffs, oh, he yeah. was on board every game. And you know, my guy was calling me up. Asking for double out, you know, right. like, that he could double up. Well, they claim Michael Jordan was bet. Nobody pushed that issue. They claimed that. Uh, well, they did catch Alex Karras and Paul Horning in that right. all they, gambling. Right. They were tanking games. Yeah. You know. They were, huh? Yeah. Well, yeah. Karras was. I mean, they weren't. T they were just not covering the spread. The spread. You know, Karras yeah. with Detroit when they had a spread that was. You know, twenty points or twelve, 12 or points or something. They went by five. You know, <laughs> so the team won. I won. I think it's a win-win. Of yeah. course, I got a jaded opinion of this right, because of my right, background, but right. um, yeah. They, but they, back to Rose, uh, I just can't see. It. It's pretty severe, I guess, because he did lie to Giamatti, or yeah. you know, he wouldn't come out. They spent a lot of time and money to get him, and you know, it, it's a shame because yeah. you know you got a Rod now waiting for his the hammer to fall on him for the same the thing. Right. For the PEDs, and uh, they're saying that there's a conspiracy theory going that the Yankees are qu are pushing Major League Baseball to, you know, right. get, him, get him out, get him suspended, so they don't have to pay so him. So to pay him. You right. know, insurance will cover that. They owe him like a hundred million, I think, over right. the next. And there's seven. stuff in his contract that says if you mess around right. with any kind of enhancement drugs or what, whatever. Well, the only way they're going to stop the country. The only way they're going to stop PEDs and steroids in baseball is they have to make a, you know, when these players sign a contract, there has to be something in there. If caught dirty, right, it, well, avoid the contract. Right, you don't get it, which it doesn't do that. Yeah. Ryan Braun's still going to get his 133 million. Right, he's, I, I think he's guaranteed 110, but with incentives and stuff that they have to honor. After this, because he already he admitted it's on the sideline, right? He's going to get 133 million. You know, it's it's amazing. I mean, it's hard. To, I mean, how would you pass if you told me take this pill and this will make you from a 275 hitter and a 10 home run guy a year and 50 RBI a year guy? This will put you at 330, 40 home runs, 140 they RBIs. They told me I could take a pill to grow hair. I get a pill tomorrow. <laughs> What other stuff? What were you wanted to discuss? Um, I think that's about. I think we've covered everything there. The football's uh, coming up. Football's coming up. Socks are covered. Their fans are going crazy. You yeah, know, can't wait till the opening because they're both tanked. The well, Sox and the uh, Cubs. You know what they did have? They they had a poll on one of the programs I was watching the other evening about the the four most story franchises in pro football, and it was San Francisco 49ers was one, Pittsburgh Steelers. Dallas Cowboys, and then the get, there was like three people they asked, you know, that right. were experts, but it came in the Bears, then the Giants were, you know, neck and neck before. Now, you go by the Giants with all, right. they've, won, they've won four championships, what four Super Bowls. Right. Bears have only, well, they won when, in the, when it wasn't it was, before right. the Super Bowl era, but they... How about Green Bay? Was Green they, Bay? They didn't have Green Bay in there. I was surprised. That's amazing. Yeah, just the top four. They didn't have Green, but they had the Bears in there. Yeah. They said that's you know one of the most hallowed uh, hallowed franchises around. You know. Yeah. And it is. You know, it's got all the history. Papa Bear Hallis. You know. Oh yeah, Sid Luckman, uh, Bronco Nagurski. Yeah. Yeah, it's got. Uh, Buckus Sayers. Yeah. Right. Well, I think we've pretty much covered yes, the uh, sports. Uh, you know, for those of you in the audience who are still with us, I want to really thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's painfully obvious that we're not using state-of-the-art uh, and professional uh, disc jockey or radio or whatever uh, sound equipment. Uh, and uh, the makeshift studio that we've been using 
is in a building that probably most of you could hear the background during the first part of this, the, uh, maybe about 10 minutes ago or, or so in this segment, that you probably heard some background noise uh, relating to some work that's being done in, uh, in or around the building. And because of the fact that we're not uh, in a, a big, shiny downtown studio and we're not using uh, the best equipment, uh, unfortunately, you were able to hear some of that noise. We apologize, and please know that we're making some progress in getting some better equipment for this show and uh, 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 a more professional studio. But uh, for those of you that may remember, this is something we're experimenting with, which is why we we have not already... Uh, secured some of the things we we should have for this show and uh, for the technical side of the show and we have uh, um, now completed the sports piece and we're going on to our behind the scenes we will be back with our next sports uh, piece on uh, Monday that's next Monday July 29th uh, thank you for for those of you who came by to listen to our sports piece today and as far as our behind the scenes, for those of you that like to stick around for it and, and uh, who were here last time, you probably remember that we mentioned that uh, Michael would be nice enough to share a story with us about his experience and recollection of uh, Evil Knievel, the, uh, the uh, 1970s and 80s famous stunt actor or performer, again, Evil Knievel. Michael, uh, if I recall, you and Jack Cerrone, the late Jack Cerrone, and a couple of your friends had the occasion of being in Mr. Knievel's company, Robert Knievel, I believe is his first name. That's correct. Did you call him Robert? or I never referred to him as anything. You just started talking just to started him? started talking to him. Uh-huh. I guess it's kind of hard to call a guy evil. evil. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of hard to call him Robert when his nickname is evil. <laughs> yeah, right. So I just would you know, point my face at him and just start talking to him. And I had very little What year? Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I'm going to let you tell the story before I do a little, um, I don't know. Commentary. Uh, yeah, thank you. Well, it was uh, back in the early 80s. Um, I, you can't quote me on the year, but it was 81, 82, something like that. I was a teenager. Um, I'd be at Rockies. He was, had his camper parked out there. And he was, you know, no rent, no nothing. He had his, you know, he had that big camper out there. He lived in it. You know, it was like a home. hillbilly. Like, well, it was his home. And he was, he was playing on the golf course. Now, I never played in any of the games with him. I just followed, you know, like as a ball hawk, you know. Right. Just uh, Washing clubs, doing, you know, caddy. You're talking about the golf course. Talking about the golf course, right. Yeah. Which golf course were you guys playing? Todd Hill I see. in Lamont, Illinois. And, you know, he was gambling big money with Jack, and Jack was, Jack was a good player. Jack was beating him. And Evil had a lot of uh, habits, you know, gambling. Uh, he liked to go to the track. Uh, I think he got hooked up with some bookmakers out here, and, or that he had wherever he came from, which I don't know. And he was betting, and one day in Rockies, he asked Jack, you know, after Jack had beat his brains and on the golf course, financially. Right. Uh, he asked him to, to lend him 5000 And Jack just reached in his pocket and said, sure. He, you know, what Jay Sharon. Right. Yeah. He gave him the five Gs, and Evil was waiting for somebody to come to the restaurant, and he gave the guy the 5000 and he says, here, now I'm even with you. Do we know who that person is? I don't know okay. who it was. And... Jack says, you borrowed 5000 from me to owe that son of a bitch? <laughs> you owe him. You mean to pay that son of a bitch? Yeah, to, to, yeah right. Yeah. You owe me to pay him? Right. Give me that money. He, he grabbed the guy, the, pulled right, like, took the money right out of his pocket, <laughs> put it back in his pocket. He says, you owe, he owes you. You ain't going to owe him to owe me. You know, I I'm not letting lend you money to pay off your debt right. to somebody else. If you want to owe me, you right. owe him. He ain't a nothing. Yeah. Yeah. That Meaning, was, right, that's what he was trying to tell them. Right. I'm Jack Cerrone. I'm the boss. The and you're going to owe me 5000 right. Out of the goodness of my heart, I give it to you, and I wouldn't even ask you a date when you're going to pay it back, but you're going to give it to somebody else that you're worried about them? Wouldn't you give them free tickets to the shows or anything? Like Jack would want to go. <laughs> <laughs> he 
Knievel, Knievel was big in those days. I mean, he oh, was he a was. big Remember he jumped the Snake River? Yeah, I mean, he was, he'd be on Johnny Carson. He'd be all, all over the place. Over Caesar's but they Palace. He looked like an Elvis in that uniform. When he walked, it was like listening to a three-piece band. You could hear him it creaking. creaking. Yeah. Every bone, he broke every bone in his body. Right. When he jumped over Caesar's Palace, I don't know if you ever saw I Caleb. Saw it. The tape of it? Oh, my God. That was in the 70s, right? You should have died. Oh, yeah. I don't know how any human... Yeah, right. I mean... He yeah. just tumbled. I mean, you could see my the, bones, the, my the bones. bones were going in ways that it was it was too graphic to even look at. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. it was, yeah. and, and this guy here kept coming back. Right, went that rocket to jump over Snake River. Yeah, then his kid got into the business with him. Almost sounds like it sounds like a a, a, a desperate person that the outfit uh, comes into uh, in, uh, comes into play with on on. Frequently, if, if when I'm talking about are people that are down on their luck and need to borrow money, and they go and they find a, a loan shark and they borrow money, and they're abused and they have to pay these large amounts of interest. Sometimes they're roughed up, but they keep coming back. They keep coming back, and it sounds like Evil can Evil, you know, was that kind of a guy, but for different reasons. He well, he was, a, he was back. A, he's a perfect guy for them. He's a guy that's used to the limelight, that he has a potential to make more money. And that's what the outfit likes to go to. Get to go try to what kind a good of, client. What kind of money did Jack uh, win off of him? Or beat up? You know, truthfully, I really don't know. It had to be more than $5,000. Oh, hell yeah. So. I remember Willie telling me about 60 something thousand. That, that I would guess, would be a, about a figure, maybe more. Uh -huh. I would think that he'd beat him for that kind of money. Sure. I would think so. Would he even have that money on him? Well, he had to pay to play. Yeah. You know, he would. He, right. There was no he, Ozies, he, right? Finally, there were no Ozies. You don't <laughs> get on the tee the next day. Oh, and, you know. So when he finally with Jake Sharon, you're playing Jake Sharon. Right. Sarone. You find he finally ran out of money, and that was it. He was yeah. not useless. I mean, he was. There was no more playing. Well, Jack was lending him his money, basically. Yeah. You know, I already right. beat you out of it. I'm gonna lend it back right. to you. Sure. But he's already lost. Do we know if Jack ever got paid back? Oh yeah, that night he wouldn't give to when he. Oh, so that was the only time Jack right. lent him money was that right. one time. When the guy was he, coming there, he says, "I got this guy coming." Here. I see. He yeah. took it right out of his hand and put it back in his pocket. He says, "You could owe him. Don't owe was me." He, he was still doing shows too, right? Yeah, he was doing the. Well, I think so. Wasn't yeah, he was I think he was. I mean, he was yeah. getting paid big money, or maybe he was almost being forced to do shows to pay back people. Yeah, yeah. The, the, he went into big. A lot of people didn't know that. They always were wondering why he kept doing it. When he was almost dying every time he did a jump or he something. He did everything that was just... He was going to jump the Grand Canyon. The canyon, and then he jumped Snake River. Right. Remember that? With yeah. the parish with the rocket ship that right. he went off in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was. Yeah. It was yeah. actually a, like a, it was a rocket, rocket ship. You know, it was a assembled rocket ship that he was going to go over Snake River. It didn't have to go off too soon, or he hit the parachute. He hit the, he hit the parachute too quick. or something. Probably, I, He wasn't going to make it. He wasn't going to make it. And he knew it. I think he was great make it. entertainment TV, live world of sports. Oh, it was time, all over the time. place. Yeah. So, I mean, it was it was a wonderful gig. It didn't take yeah. much to intrigue people in the 80s mm -hmm. with stuff like now. They, they, they do shuttles around the earth. Well, you, you watch TV today and everything is, you know, you, pretty soon you're not going to even see an actor anymore. No. The way they simulate. Yeah. Act, you know, uh, why would they pay a guy $20 million when they can punch it up? Oh, they got reality TV. A simulation they don't pay nobody the does. Right. And then you're right. Everything's uh, like 300, the movie 300. Right. It's all superimposed or, you know. Exactly. It's all computerized. It's all you know, uh, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about Willie now because it, both you and Willie have a lot of similar stories, both being around Jack around as much as you have been. And sometimes I, you know, I've heard things from you, I've heard things from Willie. And now that we're dwelling a little bit on this evil can evil stuff, I think evil might have gone for uh, in the ballpark of a hundred or a hundred twenty thousand, and it was about maybe sixty thousand in the beginning, and then it it parlayed or doubled in the could be. Does that sound like it could be? Oh, that's it's it? absolute possibility. Yeah. I, I, if you told me it was three hundred thousand, I wouldn't doubt uh, that either. I think yeah. it was about one hundred twenty. Because that's the type of money I, I know that they weren't going out there playing for five bucks a hole. No, <laughs> you know, they weren't doing that. The green fees were fifty dollars. Right. Know? So at least make enough to cover the green fees and the hot dogs and the beers at the end of the game. The one thing I do remember clearly is that Willie told me on uh, Evil's last day in Melrose Park, Illinois, as you put it, with the camper mobile home, mobile. rather, parked by Rocky's Restaurant, and then 
dilapidated looking parking lot. Um, Jack gave Willie two hundred dollars and said, "Here, gas up his uh, mobile home so he could make it out, of, so he could get the hell out of town." <laughs> I guess that's how. <laughs> how busted out he was. Well, they didn't want to deal with him. <laughs> it's right? a big tank to fill up. Yeah, right. That gas was up 88 cents a gallon. Well, maybe, yeah, Willie right. got, maybe Willie got a tip for one. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> well, I, if I was Willie, really, I, I think I would have just given him, here's 100, get the hell out of here. I took the other one. <laughs> he was like, parked by Rockies. Where, where's Rockies? Yeah. Uh, 25th of uh, yeah. North Avenue. A stone's throw east of 25th. On North, North Avenue, Avenue. North Avenue, the Avenue. south side of North Avenue. If I got a, a Harlow Grill, you're familiar with Harlow Grill. It's just yeah, across really. the street from there. Right. Famous, was it uh, a bar or a store. restaurant? Beach, uh, well, originally it was a beach stand. Yeah. And then they went into the uh, pizzas, and then they had the restaurant, and then, you know, it was a small, it was great food. Yeah. really was. Uh, was that was uh, Rocky Lombardo, Joe Lombardo, the, the now imprisoned uh, family secrets defendant. His brother Rocky, it was his namesake, and he was the cook. Wow. Jack Cerrone um, was uh, Jack Cerrone Sr., or we should say the late Jack Cerrone was his partner, but it I believe in my opinion it was it was bearded by his son, the lawyer, who may have been the 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 partner on paper as opposed to the the old man who right. was the partner period and uh from what I also remember, Michael, weren't there incidents where Rocky Lombardo would be hanging out at Hoagie's uh, on North Avenue? Yes. And uh, Jack would come to the restaurant and find that Rocky was not there, and he, you know, that'd be a little bit of a fuss, you know, Jack. Where the hell's he at? And then he'd come over right away, get in that kitchen, and start cooking. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh yeah. A uh, couple, you know, heated moments there, but. The, Jack liked Rocky. But Hoagie's was the Spalatro's joint, right? Right. Yeah. And Rocky would cook for them? No. No, he'd just go there and hang out. Probably oh, try to pick up waitresses yeah. or something if we know Rocky. You know, yeah. he, he liked Rocky was a hell of a guy. He's yeah. a hell of a guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he's, he's still alive? Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. I think he's out in Vegas, isn't he? Well, he was out there for a while. Then he got into some uh, IRS trouble out there and wound up getting uh, straight probation. He didn't oh, go really? away. And uh, I don't know what he's doing uh, now, mm-hmm. where he is or anything like that. Um, but going back to uh, Rocky's restaurant, I remember a late friend of ours, Buddy Ciotti, who told me a story about a man that he used to look up to, a guy who was called Dinger, who was also Mr. Carcello, uh, Jerry, correct, right. Michael? And yes. he was also like a an uncle, like a surrogate uncle to you, was he not? Well, I, he, he used to give me his... I, was golfing with him when I was a teenager, and I mean, like, uh, not old enough to drive teenager, 13, right. 14, 15 years old, and I was in your size already, 5'7", five, 5'8", because five, yeah. uh, he was a, you know, small guy, but uh, don't let... Size, you, right. He was a very dangerous person with his hands and with his yeah. will, yeah. and he would he would mess you up if you got... In fact, what where was he from? I mean, where was he from? Melrose? Melrose, yeah. yeah. Now, when we had dinner with Augie Taddeo, the former uh, mayor of Melrose Park last fall at Tom's Steakhouse, did I hear correct when I heard the two of you discuss the fact that Dinger and uh, Augie Taddeo are cousins? Yes. Something? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, he was one of your dad's closest friends, was oh, he not? Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. Now, I remember Buddy, according to the late Buddy Ciotti's story, he was in Rocky's restaurant one night having dinner with Dinger and a couple of other guys from Melrose Park, and uh, he ordered a regular, you know, not, uh, an unimpressive bottle of wine for his guests. It might have been a $15 bottle of wine at that time. And Probably Corvo. Yeah, sure. And uh, now, when Buddy told me the story, he said, Joe, you, he goes, you know, Dinger was gone before you came around, and so you don't know, you didn't know Dinger, and let me tell you something, Dinger was probably the, one of the roughest guys on the street, and he says, Joe, when I tell you rough, I mean rough, this guy, no one, I didn't know anybody that could beat this guy in a fight. Dinger was like a, a Bo Jackson of, of organized crime. Mm-hmm. Just, uh, you know, multi-talented. And mm-hmm. he was an athlete. Yeah. He was a great golfer, a great softball player. He was a boxer. Really? Yeah, oh, yeah, he was just... He used to go hunting with my uh, my uncle and my father. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So he, he, he was a jack of all trades. Yeah. And when I say jack, he did everything. They said he was a ball, a lot of fun. I mean, he, he was. was a, you know... 
He was. Now, uh, according to Buddy's story, they were in Rocky's restaurant, and Buddy was familiar with who Jack Cerrone was because everyone was in that area. His name was in the papers quite a bit. But he, uh, Buddy never had any real uh, up-close experiences with Jack Cerrone, except for the evening when he was sitting in Rocky's restaurant with one of the toughest guys who Buddy claims is, is Dinger. Uh, toughest guys on the street uh, and that's who Buddy was impressed with and all of a sudden uh, Jack Cerrone, the late Jack Cerrone the now late Jack Cerrone comes walking into the dining room or wherever they're sitting and says god damn it dinger you son of a bitch I hear you're going out to Giannotti's here and there you're, and you're buying a hundred dollar bottles of wine now you come in my joint and you order this shit <laughs> and um when Buddy witnessed this, you know, he thought something might happen here because Dinger doesn't take shit from anybody. The Dinger Buddy knows won't take shit from anyone. He thought, oh boy, this is going to be a problem. This is Jack Cerrone and Dinger going at it. Now Buddy's wondering, is, is Dinger going to get up and say, hey, settle down, you son of a bitch? Or, you know, he didn't know what was going to happen. But he was very surprised at what happened. What did happen? He said that Dinger looked like a, all of a sudden like a little kid that got yelled at by his father <laughs> and apologized and ordered a, a, the most expensive bottle of wine that he had in the place. I could definitely see that. <laughs> but he said he couldn't you could believe it. You could that better than what the yeah. truth was. And I'm sure that that yeah. was the truth out of Buddy's mouth. And, and he said he could not believe it. And he said that was his first real taste of the power that that man, that Jack Cerrone had when he saw someone like Dinger, you know. Right. Uh, well, who, was, who was Dinger working for? Uh, probably over at uh, Joey Ayoub, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Joey o. Yeah. He was, Dinger was, you know, he was a great guy. Yeah. He really was. Mm -hmm. Golf, I mean, my experiences with him were just golfing. You know, he died, right. I was a senior in high school when he died. Yeah. 1979. You know, he, he was, uh, he was a great guy. Yeah. Is there anything you'd um, want to mention about uh, your uh, opinion of, of who was behind the uh, killing? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Well, is it that you wouldn't know, or is it you would not want to discuss it? I, I don't know. Okay. So the, the Fair enough. To discuss it would be, you know. Fair enough. You know, I uh, don't know. But he was killed. Which he, were money guys were killed during their there. Uh, well, they sure. It seemed like a guy was dropping every week then. Yeah. Would, you, would you care to go on record, Michael, saying, uh, sharing your opinion as to why you think he was killed? Well, I have no clue about that. Would you like to take a like an educated guess? I wouldn't guess? even have an educated guess. I, yeah. have, I legit don't have any idea. Okay. Uh, I'd like to go on to a question that someone um, that goes by the name, uh, well, I'll just call him. I assume it's a him. Uh, M.T. Uh, or Marilyn. Merlin, I'm sorry. Merlin for short. Merlin wants to know from Michael if there's still a, a centralized mafia group in Chicago complete with a formally recognized boss and an upper and lower echelon whose success and future existence is dependent upon uh, violence or other threats of violence, among other things. Uh, he's asking Michael if you would just simply answer with a definitive yes or no, and we can move on to another topic. Yes. Okay, we'll accept that. Uh, and your answer again is yes. Yes. Uh, he also, and and I know that this is really pushing you to the limits based on a, a, agreements we've established, and you probably don't want to elaborate on that, do you? No, I do not. Okay, fair enough, and thank you. And uh, at this point, I would then go on to read the rest of the question where he brings your name into it, Frank. Uh, he'd also, uh, Merlin would also be interested in hearing your thoughts, Frank, as far as on how strong the outfit is today. Uh, uh, he wants you to keep in mind that he realizes corruption in its various forms is a part and parcel to the Chicago outfit, but he's not really talking about political corruption. We, I guess we all understand how the political corruption is attached 
to the outfit. It's through the uh, organized crime culture that everyone's born into in Chicago, and when right. people go out and become mailmen or police officers or or plumbers or whatever, they they still have that organized crime culture in them, and it, which tends to make them. Do, right, they're, they're do other things trained that, or because they're told who not to talk about, sure. who they're going to say. But, but more specifically, and I'll reiterate, what Merlin's asking of you, Mr. Coconati, what, um, what he wants to know from you is your thoughts on how strong is the outfit today? I, I, I have to say, you know, just from my what I've lived through from when I was in the, you know, in my teens and up until now, it's a, it's a, it's a tough question to answer because it's a different type of outfit. In the days in the uh, 60s and 70s, they were at their peak where they didn't take crap from anybody and they were wide open with everything they did, whether it be slapping a guy in the head, well, punching somebody. Would you say law enforcement has kind of changed that style of things, the, the different tech? Techniques they use. I think to what catch they did them. was they actually bought out law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So now, my opinion today, uh, the more sophisticated outfit. Uh -huh. They've they've streamlined it. They've 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 uh, fixed up some other things. But they've also killed off a lot of their killers, their own people. Mm -hmm. So it's not that, um, um, you know, where there's this right off the bat, kill, kill, kill. It's a different type of fear they put into people, and it is a culture. So there's a. Can you give us an example of a different type of fear they put into people? Well, I think economically, they could burn a guy, you know, shut him down from doing anything with money. So instead of killing people, they they kill they kill them in the pocket today. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, if a guy has... And is that illegal, though? I mean, if if, if a businessman can outmaneuver an opponent and cause um, uh, cause an opponent to not receive an opportunity, is that a, is that a crime? Is that I something... I guess it's a form of uh, intimidation. Because if you're, you're looking for work or if you're looking for some or you have a business, they call people, don't do business with him. Don't do business with him. So don't do this with him. Don't smear tactics him. designed to uh, I, I, I uh, go, character assassin. People are so assassination. Yeah, character people are so naive. They they're scared. They're scared. So if, a, if, if the right person calls, and in this city and state, there's always six degrees of separation somewhere. If someone knows this guy, they knows this guy. If you're put on bad, bad paper. You're not going to, you know, you're not going to make any money. So it's, it's almost it, what you're telling me reminds me of the old blacklist we remember was a big thing in Hollywood years yeah, ago. Yeah. So you're suggesting the outfit has, we'll call it a blacklist or a hit list, and and it's a list where if you're on this list, your character, well, how many lawyers your, your you character, know, how many me, lawyers, your character is assassinated right, if you're on this I, list. I, I, if you're a lawyer today. Mm -hmm. You don't even you don't say anything about the outfit. You don't say anything about the judges. Like we just recently we wrote about the judges. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to have nothing to do with that because it's they it's don't. Lawyers can be ruined by by being shut down by the judges. You know what's interesting? I had a I was involved in a civil matter a couple of years ago. I was in front of a, a, a district judge. I'm sorry, a, a Cook County judge in the third district, Sandra Tristano who was married to uh, Michael Tristano, who was with, uh, uh, what was it, Lee Daniels. I, I, may, I may be mixing it up, but he was po very politically connected. He got into some trouble. But that's a, that's a different matter. I was in front of Tristano on a civil matter where I was, uh, I contend I was, I was sued for unjust reasons and, and improperly served. Uh, or there was some uh, unlawful interference with service, and it turned out where I was in a, in a real bind because of those issues. And I was in front of Tristano, and the name of John DeFranzo appeared in a transcript that was presented to Tristano by my opponent in court. And it came down to it where John DeFranzo, through his attorney, Donald Angelini Jr., was calling me a liar about something. And I was calling him a liar back. And it was two people calling each right. other a liar. And uh, 
I was directly calling DeFranzo a, a liar, and DeFranzo was indirectly calling me a liar. And when we had a, a, a hearing on this matter that almost, uh, it, it was a very uncomfortable hearing because it, we weren't, we, we were, Tristano appeared as if she had an ax to grind. And she said some things that were outlined in an affidavit by a witness that would would kind of uh, that would uh, support what I say when I say that it seemed like Tristano had an axe to grind in the courtroom against me. And when we went to when we had our hearing on this matter, my attorney, my own attorney, refused to put the name DeFranzo in the record in my argument and in my defense. It's a fear that it was just he would refer to the person as the person in question or someone said right. or Mr. Angelini's client, but he would not even say the name DeFranzo. Would not. It's amazing. It, and it was in the most innocent way where it could not cause any kind of harm to DeFranzo whatsoever. Just mentioning his name, this lawyer refused. It was would not would not mention the name it is amazing that that intimidation is right. there right. and I, I don't even know if we could honestly accuse John DeFranzo of being responsible for intimidating that lawyer personally I think John DeFranzo is an intimidating person just based on who he is and his identity Reputation. and he he commands that kind of intimidation right. Just like, uh, and it, on just advert, like inadvertently, he that's, doesn't. That's the yeah. page, That's a good point you brought up because mm -hmm. that's that's the mob today. If they're living off of a reputation, the the Caruso family in Chinatown. Mm -hmm. um, they're big, and nobody talks about them. They're all making millions of dollars, yeah. along with the mayor, with the ex mayor, yeah. Fitch Daly. I mean, these they're they're so acclimated and living off this reputation. And they're powerful. They're powerful people. But one thing I don't think I heard from you, um, again, or if you can clarify, Frank, is the outfit today, is it, um, how strong is it today? Exactly. I don't think, I think you've... They're very powerful, but they're a lot more smarter. On a they're scale a lot more smarter they're, they're, okay, they're, they are smart. They are smart. They're not just going to kill the kill. They're just there's ways they do things now that are sharper than it was before. Well, but they just they have almost just they have money. Okay, and, and when money is power. Okay, and that goes back to what we said. There's, there's, uh, they have what Hollywood used to have, which is a, a blacklist. If you're on the blacklist, you're as good, almost as good as dead. You might as well be dead if you live in Illinois. If you're on the get a cup and go out there and sell pen, you know, sell pencils. Because you're done with you. And you ain't gonna get work. You ain't gonna get no break nowhere. Mm -hmm. with them. If you're, if they have, if you're not with them, you're. They're gonna find a way to hurt you. Well, and not necessarily. I not don't think you way. have to be with them. I'm sure my doctor at Rush Presbyterian's not with the outfit. But he's not hurting them either. That's that's the point. If if you if you have an issue where it would involve them and you don't go along with their way, whether they're right or wrong, then you're probably going to be added to this blacklist. Is is that your perception? Yes. Okay. In this blacklist. Uh, uh, we'll call it a hit list. It's a it's a character assassination list. As far as them killing people, they uh, killing, stopping human life. That has diminished. Would yeah. you say well, that has killed off all their killers? <laughs> not all of them. Not all of them. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think Al Bivin is a killer. That's my opinion, and I think he would kill for Defranzo. In a minute, I think he'd come in here and shoot you in your head and me alongside of you in a minute if Johnny asked him to. And uh, would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. And he's alive. So we can't say they've killed off all other killers. But a lot of them. Yeah, okay. That's it. All right. Uh, we'll be back on uh, uh, Monday, next Monday, July 29th. Thank you. Have a good weekend.